Hello everyone, here we are. Um, we're going to do the first book of First John. And there are three books, but the second and third book are just one little letter each, okay? So there are five chapters in this book. Before we get started, I'm going to do what I promised. I'm gonna take you back to First Peter chapter four, verse six, where it was speaking about Jesus preaching to the dead after his um, death on the cross, okay? And I had tied it into Jesus uh, having the keys of hell and death and going down to hell and preaching, okay? And I guess he was preaching judgment. Um, but there's another aspect to it that Enduring Word, Pastor David Guzik brings up, and that's what I was misunderstanding, so I want to share it with you, okay? Uh, for this reason, the gospel, I'm going to read you the scripture first, okay? Uh, I'm going to read you the part of the scripture, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Okay, now listen to what Pastor Guzik says about this. Let me find it. All right. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, all right, let me start from here. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who were dead. Peter also, this is Pastor Guzik, Peter also says that because of this eternal judgment, the gospel was preached to the dead. The righteous dead know and live on in constant awareness of the reality of eternity. Because remember, they're not really dead. You, they've just left their bodies behind, okay? And are rewarded by this understanding as they live according to God in the Spirit. Now, I know this is a little weird, so just take what you can, all right? Peter has already told us that Jesus preached to the spirits in prison, preaching a message of judgment. Apparently, during this same time, Jesus also preached a message of salvation to the faithful dead in Abraham's bosom, who anticipated the work of the Messiah for them. This preaching to those who are dead was not the offer of a second chance, but the completion of the salvation of those who had been faithful to God under their first chance. Okay? So the first chance is this life. Okay? Okay? So now they're in the second place, and he's just wrapping it up for them, okay? Let's get going with uh, 1 John. If you don't understand it, the Lord will open your understanding in due time, okay? I find often that the answer comes to me later if I don't get it right away, okay? So here we go. 1 John. So this is John, the one who wrote one of the Gospels, okay? And this is his letter to the believers, um, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've seen with our eyes, he's speaking as himself, which we've looked at and our hands have touched, meaning Jesus, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. And word has a capital W, uh, the word of life. The life appeared we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that we've seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and don't live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. <coughs> Excuse me. As long as I live in Massachusetts, <coughs> it'll be a never-ending battle with my sinuses. You know, when we lived out here when I was little, 
And then we moved to California. My mother said to me all the time, you know, he finally has clear sinuses. When we were in Massachusetts, it was awful. And obviously I'm just like him. And I just suffer year round with either a dry throat or a stuffed nose or, or something, okay? All right, so here we go. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we haven't sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you won't sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One, capital R, capital O. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We know that we've come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard, yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. So perhaps he's saying, yet I am writing you a new command. Maybe these are new believers, new listeners, okay? It's truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. This is a repetition here. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. For if they'd belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So he's talking about people who've left the group that were not really Christians. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and he's going to go more into the spirit of Antichrist. He's saying, you know, there are other, what did he say here? Uh, even now many Antichrists have come. And then he's talking about people who've left their group as if, and he's going to talk about a spirit of Antichrist coming up, okay? But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. Who's the liar? It's whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father, Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. As for you, see that what you've heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. So he's calling them antichrists. They have that spirit. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. 
If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we're children of God and what we will be has not yet been made known. In other words, we don't know what's going to happen when we go into glory. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So we work hard to, you know, walk a good walk to get ready for him. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Remember, if you break one commandment, you're just considered a lawbreaker. Doesn't matter which one you broke or how many. You're just, you're a lawbreaker. That's who you are. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Now, I'm going to think that if it says no one who lives in him keeps on sinning, I am going to assume that that means that we get our sins forgiven, that we repent and our sins are forgiven us. And so that way we're cleansed, okay? So we could actually say, yes, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. But it also means anything that's mastering you and that you're a slave to, that's a problem, okay? And you have to remember this. There's no bondage so great that you can't choose to get out of it. It's like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz with the red shoes. She had the power to go home the whole time just by clicking those shoes together, the heels, okay? So it's the same thing. If something's mastering you, you have the power because of the gift of free will to choose to get out of it. Now, it, it may not look like, if it's drug addiction, it may not look like an instant stopping of drugs, but it could be a choice to get yourself some help and pick up the telephone, okay? Uh, once again, no judgment here, all right? No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Because it's really hard to stay in your sin the closer and closer you get to God as far as addictive sins or sins that are really mastering you, the fleshy ones. It's really hard. The more you draw close to God and you learn of him, it's hard to keep honoring those sins. They fight against the spirit. You know, it's that war of the flesh and the spirit. And something's got to win, okay? Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who's born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They can't go on sinning because they've been born of God. And see, I have found that to be true. It's like, really impossible to be in church hearing about God and then be uh, having sex with random men. I'm speaking for myself. That's a really hard dichotomy. Now, I've done it, okay? But I came to a place where I had to say, I can't do this anymore. I've got to make a choice. And I made that choice, okay? It was a hard choice and it was hard to get it done, okay? But it got done because the heart in me couldn't fight anymore. I couldn't live like that anymore. And I certainly couldn't pursue God. That was in the way. It was in the way to be doing these fleshy things, having physical relationships with people. I couldn't see God over the person, and I really wanted God, okay? But that was a process too, okay? It was a quicker one than perhaps getting free of drug addiction was, but it was a process for me. That's how I learn, okay? A lot of times I have to take steps, all right? Whereas I told you some people, they come to the Lord and they never do another drug or drink another beer and they were severe addicts and that's just they get instant healing. It's different for everybody. I'm not saying that I didn't get instant healing, but I had to walk out my healing through a program, okay? All right, the one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous, Jesus. The one who does what's sinful is of the devil because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who's been born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They can't go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. 
For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Don't be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Uh, his brother. And why did he murder him? You remember the story of Cain and Abel. Why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteousness. Were righteous. I'm sorry, not righteousness. His brothers' acts were righteous. Don't be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who doesn't love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now, I want to touch on this one more time. Don't be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So there was something about Abel's righteous actions that made Cain convicted and angry and angry and angry until he killed him with a rock. Okay, now you can see that played out in life all around you. And I'll tell you my own personal experience. I've had it twice. Um, and I've told you, I'm not going to belabor uh, the story, but there was a woman that I brought into uh, work. I trained her how to do the job and she really turned on me and tried to spiritually murder me in my place of business. And finally, the pastor said to me, Autumn, you're up against a Cain and Abel spirit and you need to come out. And so I had to walk out of a very good job, probably the highest paying job I'd ever had. Okay. Because it was getting tremendously evil. Okay, because she was just really at me and for some and, and the Lord used it to pull me out of there. The second time was Gabrielle, my daughter, who took me into court. And I really didn't see how she had too many complaints about me raising her daughter, who was a fine young woman at that point, and yet she went after me. And it was because her own acts are unrighteous and she hates my Christianity. So you're going to find that. And I want to warn you of that, okay? That some people are angry because you're serving the Lord and it makes them very angry. I don't, I, there's probably jealousy mixed in there, although jealousy is its own demon, okay? I mean, there's a scripture that says anger is one thing, wrath is another, but who can stand before jealousy? And I believe that's a proverb. Um, so, you know, jealousy is its own demon, but there's also the offense that being righteous brings. And what does righteous mean? Being in right relationship with God. Okay. This is how we know what love is. Uh, excuse me. I don't know if I read this last line. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. And I want to say something about that too. Remember how we were talking about Jesus was saying, get it into your heart. Like there's, you know, you've heard it said an eye for an eye, but I'm saying, you know, if you do this, then, you know, that. And Jesus was saying, stop being hypocritical and pretending to obey these commands. Get it into your heart and change your heart, okay? So this is the same thing. You know, if you're hating on your brother and sister, the root of that is, is murder, Okay, and it's in there. Get it out of your heart. Okay, get it out. Uh, because you know no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. I mean, at the very least, serving them. You know, I'm, I don't think that this is completely literal. He's saying, you know, serve one another, love one another. If anyone has material, and then he explains it. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? And that's the scripture that was coming out of my mouth at three in the morning when I was woken up by the Lord. And that scripture was pouring out of my mouth. And it was regarding the two pastors that said, God bless you, and sent my granddaughter and I home to a house in the middle of winter in the snow, freezing with no electricity and uh, no heat when they had a mansion with many rooms, okay? And when I woke up with that scripture pouring out of my mouth, I knew I got the message because it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And I, the message was, get out of that church. The love of God isn't in them. I'm going to read it one more time. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. 
Dear friends, if our hearts don't condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Now, your heart condemning you is your conscience, okay? So if your conscience isn't bothering you, wonderful. Let me read that again. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Anything you ask. You have a need? Make sure your conscience is clear. Confess your sins, repent, and then ask. And receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the, same, the, the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Now, in an earlier chapter, it said the spirit teaches us all things. And I'm going to attest to that. The spirit tells you a lot of stuff. Uh, chapter four. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, which is what I did in the vision I was having where I was fully awake in the middle of the night to the centurion that was at the end of my bed that I asked about my daughter. Before I started the conversation with, is she going to die? I tested him and I don't remember how I tested him, but I wanted to make sure that he wasn't a demon appearing to me as an angel of light and he wasn't. Okay, so do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Now, you can do that with a human being. You can test their spirit. Uh, just by asking a couple questions, you can find out where they're at. You aren't going to open a conversation like that. But there may come a time in the conversation where you ask them, you know, where are you at? You know, what is your belief system? You know, find out if they can't say Jesus is God or if they tell you no way, then that's a spirit of Antichrist. Doesn't mean you run screaming out of the house. You just put it in your back pocket and you know where that person's coming from. Uh, don't believe every spirit. Test them to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So he's talking about testing the spirits of mankind, people you meet. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Remember I said he was going to expound on that, that there are many Antichrists? Well, he's talking here about the spirit of Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. I had a woman today online try to catch me. She tried to bait me the way they used to try to bait Jesus and trick him. She tried to trick me. And I told her, I said, you know, there's a spirit of Antichrist working here. I, I don't receive this. It was weird. She asked me this very weird, convoluted question that made no sense at all. And I immediately, my ears pricked up and I ended up just telling her, you know, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And she said, well, I'm not an atheist. And I didn't say anything, but see, it doesn't even matter if they're not an atheist yet they're attacking a Christian. She started talking down to me and saying something to me. You need to look into gaslighting. We were talking about the witches in Salem. I did not know what she was talking about, but it sounded to me like she was trying to beat on the Christians who made the terrible mistake with the witch burnings, okay? Because Cotton and Innocent Mather, his son, were in charge of all that. And those Christians were Puritan Christians. They were hardwired. And the Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So this hysteria started. It ended up with Cotton and Innocent sobbing and crying because it was so out of control. And they finally put their foot down and said, this has to stop. Excuse me. This has to stop. So it was a terrible travesty. Mass hysteria came out of it. And that's how 19 witches were um, hung. One of them was crushed, the only man in the group. Uh, they just stacked stones on him until he couldn't breathe. These people are sickening the way they devise these ways to execute people and torment them. 
But anyway, this woman came at me like a snake, very stealthily, because I was having this discourse with somebody about the witches, and we were having a lot of fun. All of a sudden, she comes in with this weird spirit and says, you need to understand gaslighting, as if the Christian's preaching is gaslighting. So I took offense to that, but I didn't say anything. But I did tell, whatever I said, I ended up by saying, you know, I'm sensing a spirit of Antichrist here, can't, can't play this. And then she really wigged out, which just kind of proved it. So anyway, um, all right. So we, um, this is the spirit of, of the Antichrist, which you've heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who's in you, Jesus, is great. The Holy Spirit is greater than the one who's in the world. The devil, the, who's giving this, putting the spirit of Antichrist out there and people are buying into it and playing into his hands. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And this is exactly what happened. And the world listens to them. We are from God, although no one was listening to her. She just kind of jutted in like she was jealous that we were having this really fun conversation. And the world listens to them. And the guy I was talking to wasn't a Christian. We, were, we weren't even talking about Christ. But at one point I had talked about cotton and innocent and the Puritan Christians and how the whole thing was just horrible. All right. Um... And the world listens to them. We're from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever's not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. It's really quite simple, people. And you don't have to put up with people who are trying to trick you and trap you. They did the same thing to Jesus, okay? Nothing's changed. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. No one's ever seen God. So don't listen to these pastors who are telling you, I looked in Jesus' eyes and I saw this and his eyes are so beautiful and they're brown and beautiful. Don't. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, us and his love is made complete in us. So people may see God in the sense that they're seeing Christians loving one another and having a, a different kind of life than what the world offers, Okay. And in that, they're seeing the Spirit of God. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He's given us of His Spirit. And we've seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. Okay, so there's a, a colon there. Um, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment, colon. In this world, we're like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever doesn't love their brother and sister whom they've seen can't love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command, colon, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Okay. All right. Uh, chapter five and the last one for tonight. And then tomorrow we'll do the two letters and then we'll do the second and third in, of, John, for, of John. And then we'll do Jude, which is also very, very short. Okay. And then Revelation is right there laid out open for us. All right. First John five. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, colon, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that's overcome the world, even our faith. 
Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Those are the winners in this world. That's me talking. Those are the winners. This is the one. You want to win in life? You believe Jesus is the Son of God. And you listen to what he's telling you to do. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He didn't come by water only, but by water and blood. And it, it probably, uh, because Mary, I mean, I'm assuming water and blood, Mary was a virgin. So I'm, and usually childbirth has blood in it. So I'm going to assume that that's what it's saying. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He didn't come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the spirit, the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. I might have to look into that a little bit just to kind of parse it out for us. We accept human testimony. So if I tell you about Jesus, you can listen and accept that, uh, that what I'm saying. But God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony of God, which he's given about his son. Whoever believes in the son of God accepts his testimony, which is what we're reading. Whoever doesn't believe God has made him out uh, whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God's given about his son. So if you say you don't believe it, you're saying, well, that God's a liar. It's not true. And this is the testimony. God's given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever doesn't have the son of God does not have life. You're an unlit candle. I write the, that's me talking. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, colon, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Now, it says according to his will, ask according to his will. So obviously you're not going to say, um, will you send me a shipment of pot? That's not in his will. But if you say, can you help me pay my bills? That would be in his will. He's promised to take care of us. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that doesn't lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. I refer to those whose sin doesn't lead to death. Now I'll look into that too. I mean, I kind of get what's being said here, but I'm going to get a better word, you know, to pull it up, to pull this word apart for you. Um, I'm going to get a better teaching than what I can give you on it. I refer to those whose sin doesn't lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that you should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin, and there's sin that doesn't lead to death. Intriguing. I need to pull that apart for me. We know that anyone born of God doesn't continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps them safe. Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> <coughs> We know that anyone born of God doesn't continue to sin. So it's kind of a recap of what he told us before. The one who was born of God keeps them safe, Jesus, and the evil one cannot harm them. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. Dear children, keep yourself, yourselves from idols. And that's one verse, 21. So it's 1 John 5, verse 21, last verse. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Very important, okay? And there's a lot of idols out there. Um, when it says the evil one cannot harm them because Jesus is keeping us safe, that's, a, that's, that's if you remember, the Apostle Paul was saying, I know that my ship is going to reach that shore safely. Uh, you know, because Jesus is watching over my life, okay? We're going to get there. No matter what we go through, we're going to get there safe and sound, okay? I love you very much. Tomorrow we'll do Second John and Third John and Jude. So you have a wonderful evening. And pray for me, okay? I'm up against some deadlines with some bills, and I don't have any money because they refused my workman's comp. And when I say I don't have any money, I don't have any money. I think I have $10 in the bank. But I've got a need of $400, so I need you to pray hard. Because when you guys pray, stuff happens over here. I need you all to pray. 
and just keep that number 400 in your mind because that's going to cover a car payment and it's going to cover the insurance. Just pray for me. I am coveting those prayers. I love you and I will see you soon. I am praying for you too. I love you and I'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.